All right. Hi. Today we're uh, another episode of XR Advance. We're very excited to have Greg Welch here from University of Central Florida. He has a very interesting combination of roles at the College of Nursing as well as in computer science and, uh, and the Institute for Simulation Training. So he's going to tell you all about how he combines all of those interests. So two things. First, I, I, I actually won't be talking much about my work in healthcare today. I'm going to try and stick to the topic that was, uh, I'll show you the second one of the eight topics of doing better in our workshop. But the other thing I was going to say is, yes, I am a, uh, my primary appointment is in the College of Nursing, but I'm not a nurse. Stephen heard me say this before, but I always tell people I'm the only faculty member in the College of Nursing who passes out at the side of blood, which is really true. I had my colleagues rescue me before. So uh, I am learning about nursing, but I'm a computer scientist and engineer. So I've worked for years. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree. I have an electrical engineering background, and then CS, MS, and PhD. Worked for NASA for a while, a defense contractor uh, before I went to grad school. Um, and so all technical sorts of things. So today, I am want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, a love I have of um, tracking. And this comes about, let's see, so I just hit the right arrow. How do I advance? I thought right arrow, but no. How should I advance? Space? However, you would normally do it in the email. Normally, I would do it in, and the content would change. Right now, it's not going to apply the first. Maybe you just bring it right there. I did it. Oh, you're so smart. This is why you are, you get the big bucks. You're as deputy director of interest. So, all right, so I don't know how much context you've given people in the past, but I wanted to pull this picture up. This is the workshop that Steve and Wendy Nelson and Jim Radcliffe organized uh, 2017, July. And so there were a bunch of us got together to talk about a bunch of things related to VR and AR. And so one of those topics that distilled out of it, one of the big topics, was identifying user physical states. So that's primarily what I want to talk about today, uh, or what I am going to talk about today. So in largely, it's mostly this. Uh, tracking and uh, some personalization stuff at the end. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about, I'm not going to talk at all about HRTF, head, head related uh, transfer functions for audio. I know what they are, but I don't know much about them. So I won't be talking about those. So I really wanted today to do, I've kind of got this talk in three pieces. The first is some fundamental ways in which people do tracking. And I'll go through this kind of quickly because you guys may know all this. And I don't want to bore you, but uh, there's some very fundamental ways, not the only ways you could do tracking, but the typical mechanisms by which people do it today or historically have done it. Um, then I, I have some uh, quick review of some existing systems and to tie those back into the first part, how they work, what they do, uh, just a few case, sort of case studies. And the third part is about some future looking uh, research and maybe some, maybe some interesting questions for us to, to talk about. So the first, so from uh, 2001, you can see here, uh, Gary Bishop and, uh, and I and Danette Allen, one of my PhD students at the time, taught a course on tracking. And so I just grabbed a couple of ideas or concepts from there. One of them was that when you talk about tracking and how you can do tracking, there are so many different ways to, we would say, slice it, to talk about the problem. You can talk about it in terms of the configuration. You've probably heard people talk about inside out versus outside in, uh, which I'll tell you and show you in a bit is not always the best um, choice of words to describe things. Uh, type of measurement, are they absolute, relative, range versus angle, the different devices, how you do the computation, and what is the physical medium that you're using? So I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just telling you there are lots of different ways to talk about it. So I am going to talk about physical mediums uh, a little bit first. So uh, these are the obvious six that we all probably know and love. or that are embodied into, that are used in today's tracking system. Uh, inertial sensing or inertia sensing, accelerometers and gyros, acoustic sensing, magnetic, mechanical, this means like linkages, like potentiometers and, and, uh, and the sort, uh, optical tracking and RF or radio frequency tracking. So the uh, both, or three, acoustic, magnetic and optical are a little bit unique because you can do those passively, that is, without necessarily injecting energy into the scene, or you can do them actively by creating targets that are, are uh, created by some electrical current. Uh, optical is a little weird because it's kind of a mix of passive and active, most of them today, so I'll tell you what I mean by that. So I think I have one slide, maybe two slides, on um, inertial sensing, 
not that much to tell you except there was a time, for those of us, or maybe most of us are, uh, not, don't remember this, but there was a time when you had like aircraft navigation, ship navigation, when they would have stable like gimbal platforms. So you'd have a gyro, this mechanical gyro spinning around, and it would be on some complex mechanical platform that would attempt to keep it level as the ship or the plane tilted and rolled and pitched and banked. They would measure the amount of uh, deflection of that stage would be part of what was used to help them navigate. The, we, the 1980s, is it? Boy, that's trouble I should know, but roughly, I'll say roughly the 80s, there's a long period of time when we transition to what are now called strap down um, inertial devices. And so this is just one example I picked off of the Adafruit website, 9 degree of freedom. So it has three degrees of freedom accelerometers in this chip, uh, three axis magnetometer, three axis gyro, and it also has temperature because you want temperature because a lot of times the calibration changes with these devices depending on temperature. So you want to know what's going on. So what's the big difference mathematically or otherwise? Here, what's really this required the transition from this to strap down, but no moving parts here, required people to really rethink how you integrate the values from these accelerometers and, and uh, gyros. The reason is because this is, as the words imply, attached or bolted to the side of the aircraft or to the head of the user or to the hand or whatever. So what's happening is while the aircraft the hand is moving, unlike this, these gyros and accelerometers are all rotating with the body. So as you're rotating, moving your head around, the gyros are constantly reorienting themselves. The accelerators are constantly reorienting themselves. So in order for you to integrate them, you have to know the correct frame of reference. So you have to basically unrotate them in some sense and then do the integration to get a rotation in the world coordinate frame. So you, you have to end up having to simultaneously solve these differential equations which describe the relationships between all of these devices on that. So it's, it's a bit more complex. Uh, than you know it would have been in the old days, but the benefits are you know micro machine, very small, very precise, uh, very low drift rates, all sorts of good things that come come from that. So drift, I mentioned. This is the I think this is the only medium slide that I have. Two, well, I have two that have two. Anyway, drift is a big thing. Inertial drift. You guys have heard about this, probably. What causes drift? Drift is that the user is moving. There's some true acceleration in the case of a linear accelerometer. There's some noise that gets added in. The noise is temperature bias, it's mechanical bias, it's maybe electrical noise. All of that is integrated along with the true acceleration of the user, which you never really know. So all you get is, uh, is this sum right here. You get the user's true acceleration plus some noise, and you're trying to integrate that. And so you're always, in a sense, trying to, you wish you knew what this term was, this error term, so you can get rid of it before you integrate, but it's very hard to get rid of. One of the factors that you always have to get rid of Accelerometers measure gravity. Gravity vector is this fortunate or unfortunate. Without it, we'd all be floating off the surface of the Earth. Could be fun, um, but at any rate, it's there. We can't can't not deal with it. It's like you know 9.8 meters per second squared force down or up, depending on how you want to think about it. And so, if you are using accelerometers that measure uh, meters per second squared, that measure those forces, and you want to measure me moving to the left or the right then there's always what you're measuring is the combination, just like it says here, is the sum of the gravity vector and my motion vector, my motion, my acceleration. And so in order for you to figure out which part is my acceleration, you have to get rid of the gravity vector. You have to subtract out. It's really hard because you have to know very precisely. 9.8 meters per second squared is big. And so the point here is if you're wrong by even one degree over 10 seconds and you're integrating your position, your estimate of where I could be could be off by nine meters. It depends on how you do things. It's a lot. It grows very quickly because you're integrating twice. Uh, depends on a lot of things, but it's bad, right? So how do people how do people mitigate this? Because this is a black box. You can't see, you know, what's happening in terms of the noise being added. So the way it's typically done, because inertial sensors are relative or or um, differential, they only measure changes in motion, or position, or orientation. So usually you use some sort of inertial aiding. So it might be acoustic. And talk about that in a minute, optical or magnetic or something else, I don't know what, mechanical, um, that you use for, to either periodically reset this or to, to be the thing you want, or you might use it to periodically adjust your estimate of what this is, or you can have a hybrid approach where these, where these things are intertwined, the, the inertial and the acoustic or the optical are working together uh, to try to control, uh, to best estimate this, to control the drift. So if you don't, 
do something to control that drift, inertial-based estimates will always, over time, end up. The, the error is unbounded. They will grow to infinity. The error will grow to infinity if you don't do something about it. Magnetic. Um, do you guys use magnetic trackers here? These were for a while. So does anybody know what was? Flock of birds, all those. Do you, so you guys have this six-sided visualization thing. Do you know what historically was done in some of the early six-sided projection systems in order to use magnetic trackers? They were built on wood. So there are places that built the entire apparatus out of wood so that you didn't have ferromagnetic materials that interfered with magnetic trackers. And magnetic trackers were very popular, very robust. This is before we had like intersense and uh, other things. And they're still very popular. And they're awesome for certain things. So the way these work, as you can see, this plastic thing here, they've got three coils, this one going around each, you know, the equator, one around this way, and one around this way. And there is a trans, so that's a transmitter uh, in this case, and there's a receiver, a small, typically small device that would have three other orthogonal coils. And they basically set up magnetic fields with this coil, and you sense them with the other coil. So you can sense the, the currents that are induced in, the, say, the one you're wearing on your wrist in order to figure out its distance from the object, its relationship sort of orbitally from this object and its own orientation. So it's, it's pretty, they're pretty robust, pretty nice. Uh, magnetic fields go through many things, like people, which is really nice. Um, they, unfortunately, uh, uh, confounded by ferromagnetic material. So when you set up a magnetic field here, it induces a current in the ferromagnetic materials that creates another magnetic field around that material. And so then the receiver is, gets pulled away from or biased away, it gets distorted. The, 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 in effect, the magnetic field gets distorted, is the way people talk about it. Um, and there are two, I don't think that I, oh, I may, I may have examples later, but there are two ways of doing, well, there are at least two, two main ones are AC and DC currents here. And there's one company who uses primarily AC currents, and there's one other company, separate company, that actually have a shared lineage historically. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the other company does uh, primarily the other. So DC, AC means that it's actually sending an AC signal to the magnetic coils for a period of time. So there's like a sinusoidal signal. So the coils are you know, setting up one way, then reversed, then the other way, and then back and forth. The AC um, folks set up the field once. They, in, in, they energize the coil, wait a second, and then tear it down again. So the difference is that the induction of current in the ferromagnetic materials in the AC case is happening repeatedly because the current's going both ways back and forth. It's, it's creating, it's breaking down, it's creating, it's breaking down constantly. So you're getting this like glowing extra transmitter over where this ferromagnetic stuff is that you wish you didn't have. The AC ones, the only time you get this extra transmitter is when the, during the transitions. So they can wait for the transition to pass, then take measures, and then wait for the transition to pass. And so two different ways of doing that active thing. Optical, and the people remotely can't raise their hands, but you guys locally, if you have a question, just, I know I'm kind of blasting through, just raise your hand or shout out. So optical, this is not super comprehensive, but two main classes of devices people would use are cameras, as we all know, pixel-based cameras, we're all very familiar with them. Uh, small CCD, for example, be one, one type. Um, and so it's a discrete number of pixels, typically two-dimensional in a plane, typically. Um, not always, but typically. Or another commonly used uh, sensor or detector, it's called a photodiode of some sort. So these are analog sensors. These are discrete digital. So this has an address, this pixel has an address, every pixel has its own address. And you can interpolate between the pixels to get sub-pixel resolution if you want, but your measures are only on these discrete boundaries. These are analog. So what a photo detector measures, in, like a lateral effect photodiode, is light hits this surface somewhere, and the sensor basically reports back to you what the position of the centroid of that light is on here. So if I took a flashlight or a laser pointer and, showed, and shined it on one of these sensors, it would say, you know, like basically x equals zero here and x equals one down here, or something like that, and everything in between. Okay? So the quad cell is similar except it has four regions. Each region measures intensity, gives you a measure of intensity of light hitting it. So from the ratios of these intensities, you can kind of figure out where on that two dimensional surface is hitting. So this will give you 2D measurements of the centroid of light, this will give you 1D measurements of the centroid of light. Anybody think of a problem with measuring centroid of light or a difficulty of dealing with the centroid of light is compared to this guy here? 
Anybody sitting here in the audience? Watch out, it's weird shaped lights. Weird shaped lights, or just the fact that these measure all, all light hitting it. So this, you can discern like outlines of figures, silhouettes of objects and things like this. There's only one number here. It goes from zero to one. That's it. And so you turn on lights in this environment, any light that's anywhere, if I shine this laser pointer over here, it's probably influencing that sensor in some way. So all the light is combining and going into that sensor. So it means you really have to control the light. You basically only turn on the thing you want to measure. Everything else has to be off. So you're either operating in the dark with occasional blinking thing, or you do multiplex lights like these are on most of the time, but occasionally they're off, but you don't know it. And the thing you're interested in tracking turns on. So flip it around. Those are the sensors or the, the detectors. So now what are you going to use to create the light or, or reflect the light? The, the two basic methods people typically use are either, and you might call this passive, so they're just materials that reflect. They might be little, you've seen these lycra suits with these retro reflective balls and, and uh, the actors dance around and move around and you see Gallum acting in the movie. This is how they, they capture his, uh, the actor's movement to, that would then be reproduced on the Gallum character. So it's passive in the sense that on the surface that you're measuring, there's nothing uh, emissive. There's only reflected light. But it's active in the sense that your cameras typically have what are called ring lights around them. So it's light that's coming from the same direction as the camera is seeing, and the re retro reflectors reflect it back in this frequency. Or, of course, you can have emissive targets like LEDs would be the most common. And they can be infrared, some wavelength, some range of wavelengths, or they can be visible red, green, blue, LEDs, whatever you want. So those are all different, at least two main classes of sources. And now, I mean, I didn't cover everything. I just wanted to cover those couple because they're relevant to the examples I'm going to show in a moment. How do you compute doing all this stuff? So one method that was historically used, if you look at papers, is something um, maybe called a batch method or a closed form method, where you would take a bunch of measurements. So if it was a camera, I'd measure you know, this corner feature over here, that corner feature over here, this line here. I'd take all these measurements, and then I would put them all through an algorithm where I would try to come up with an answer. And so risk, basically what you're doing is you're trying to estimate the pose of the camera, in my example, from all of those things you measured. Another approach that people use is to use uh, we call it a stochastic, stochastic approach, or an approach that is optimal in some means uh, statistically. And typically, these are the most common examples of Kalman filter. And here's an uh, article I wrote many years ago, 1995, with Gary Bishop, which is very, very popular still to this day for people who want to learn about the Kalman filter. The Kalman filter is one of the most common mechanisms people use for doing stochastic estimation in tracking and many other things. The odd thing is, when you're doing this, this old mechanism, you estimate the pose from what you measure. When you're doing this mechanism, you're actually estimating what you would measure if I told you the pose. So it's reversed a little bit, which is kind of an odd uh, set of circumstances. But that's, uh, those are at least two different ways of uh, computing. All right, so take a breath. I want to show you a couple of example systems. There's not much to see here. Magnetic, a few of the two big companies. Polinas, typically AC, Ascension, DC. These companies do a lot of other things. So they don't just do this. But in the context of this talk, those are the two I wanted to mention. So Ascension, for example, has medical uh, tracking things. They have, they have medical tracking systems where they have a uh, transmitter that's like flat and you can lay on the table under the patient. And then they have these very, very, very small receivers that they actually feed through an artery even and track as it goes through the body using the magnetic tracker. So they're, they've got some pretty cool stuff. And as I said, they do a lot of other things besides uh, this magnetic tracking, both Lemus and Ascension. Those are two active examples. Third tech, I won't spend much time on this because it's no longer available, but it's something I worked on many, many years ago and it was a product, um, a tracking system. This is what would, people would typically call inside out because you put this object on your head or your hands or some device you're holding and it has cameras that look out at the world. And so in this case, what we did was the ceiling had a bunch of LEDs on it here, infrared LEDs that would flash periodically. These, I'll call them cameras, but these are lateral effect photodiodes, actually, just like I said earlier. Um, so these, quote unquote, cameras, it's easy to talk about them that way, would measure, would look, spot these LEDs as they're flashing and navigate, figure out where you were. So this was uh, noteworthy at the time because you could do, we could do very large areas. 
you could do VR over a very, very large space and get submillimeter accuracy, arc of second resolution accuracy, very precise, very low latency, submillisecond latency even, um, and very large areas. But as I said, it's no longer available. Uh, the company stopped selling them two years ago. You've probably seen these, anybody who's out in the virtual land or here in the room. Um, Natural Point is one example of Icon. Other uh, companies make systems like this. But again, it's these retroreflective little passive spheres. They're nothing but little, like the material that's on a stop sign, basically. So put those all over your suit. I don't know where they are. Put a bunch of cameras around you. And oh, by the way, I put some on this ball here, retroreflective things on the ball. And they're thinking very fast using these special cameras. Um, try to estimate the posture of the bodies. This would typically be called outside in, people, because the cameras are now, rather than the cameras being on the person and looking out at the world, the cameras are in the world looking into the person. So people would often refer to this as uh, outside in. Um, you can see, you know, what's a problem, you guys probably are familiar with this, but a problem, a difficulty with motion capture, there are two difficulties. Um, anybody think of a difficulty with this sort of motion capture? Occlusion is a big one, absolutely. So occlusion is a big one, right? They block each other from the camera and field of view. Anybody for a, se a second one? I won't say B, but it's another, another one. It's another one. It comes to mind for me. Interference? Uh, interference? No, no, yes, but that's not the one I was thinking of. But. So the one I'm thinking of, the difficulty I'm thinking of, is estimating orientation. So when you are, uh, when you are have an inside-out system, like the highball I showed earlier, that has cameras or sensors on the head looking out at the world, your, abil your ability to estimate the orientation of the rotation of the body is independent of the distance to the object, unless you can't see the light anymore. Here, distance matters. The only way to estimate the orientation of his head, if there's only one dot, you can't estimate the orientation of the head. So you need at least two, and to get two degrees of freedom, three to get more. And as you get farther away, those dots get closer and closer to each other in the perspective, in the perspective view of the camera. So that it, it starts to approach the resolution of the camera itself. So it's, it's much less sensitive to measuring small rotations of that body uh, from a distance. So, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's catastrophic. Or it clearly is workable. It's an awesome approach. People, uh, it works well for many, 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 many circumstances. There is, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, Face Space. Uh, Tracy McSherry, uh, founder, I think still CEO of the company, uh, or CTO maybe. They, it's similar, except instead of retroreflective balls, they use LEDs. And by the way, OptiTrack, the previous system I showed you, you can use LEDs with theirs too. They, they will sell you LEDs and you can use those. Um, so these are lit up infrared, although they're, they're, they're such in the infrared that you can see them visibly, so it looks cool while you're using them. Low red, all over the place. The cameras they develop, their sensors, are amazing. Now, it's a little hard to know exactly. A lot of times these manufacturers quote specs. It's hard to know, you know, first of all, what does this mean in terms of my performance in the space where I'm doing VR? Who knows? But it sounds good, you know, and it's certainly a lot. That's, but they do say that's sub-pixels. So this is interpolating between the, the pixels of their camera. It's hard to know. I don't know how many, what the resolution of the cameras is natively. Everybody can do sub-pixel resolution. Anybody can do that on any system. It requires computation, so they probably do it very fast in hardware on the camera. 960 frames per second. Pretty fast. So very low latency, very... Uh, very able to capture movements very quickly. Uh, hybrids. So um, the PhD students, I'll tell you a story sometime about it. I had, a P I had a PhD topic once, and I had an approved committee and was all ready to do this my dissertation this area. And I had a new idea, and I came to my advisor and shared my new idea. And my advisor, Gary Bishop, said, let me go away from it. And he went away and talked to some people, came back and said, I'll tell you what. He said, if you stay with your old idea, uh, it's probably two years before you finish. If you switch to this new idea, I think you could finish in August. And this was like in May or something like that. Like, oh. And my wife was working full time at the time and driving long distances. And I sat there for a moment. And I, Gary said, uh, Should I call your wife and ask her opinion? And I said, Nah, I don't think I can do that. I think I, I think I know the answer. So I switched. But this was the area of my original PhD work long ago was hybrid inertial optical tracking. So the idea was you had inertial sensors, and yes, these are old, so that's a gyro. They're accelerometer, they're huge. So these are not strapped down devices. These are mechanical gyros inside there. There's accelerometers in there. Fast forward today, Intersense, or so bought by Talus now, a company that has made, uh, is that what I was using in the, in the, um, in the uh, projection system upstairs? What was the tracker upstairs? Is that magnetic? You guys know? 
in the in the cave upstairs in the it's, subsided. It's, um, whatever you call it. It's ultrasonic. So InnerSense has a version that's a hybrid inertial ultrasonic, the IS-1200, or the IS, yeah, one of the models before this. So they, InnerSense, Eric Foxland, who was an MIT grad many years ago, founded this company, InnerSense, it's been making amazing systems. Eric now works for Fitbit. InnerSense got sold to Talus. Talus is still carrying these on. But this, I just wanted to show this in the context of hybrid inertial optical. This unit has inertial sensors built into it and a camera and all the hardware and software and computation that work uses these things together to allow you to, to have hybrid tracking in your and optical domain. So you guys are all familiar with the uh, Lighthouse uh, um, tracking system. Does anybody in the room know how these work? I mean, I'm giving it away here, but why it's called Lighthouse? It's kind of a cool idea. So the way these work is you've got this thing, and I've got this, this animation that's looping here, which is what we know of as the base station. It's covered up up here. And here it is exposed. The, uh, yes, I just felt something. It's either an animal crawling up my leg or the microphone falling. Yeah. Take the microphone as I bash people's ears. The way this works is, and this is where inside out versus outside in breaks down, as a, in some sense, as terminology. This has two things going on. One is you'll see this periodic flash here. This is a synchronization. So all of the handheld units, all of the units you're tracking the device see, hopefully, this flash at the same time. So it's, it's a pulse, a timing pulse to synchronize them. Why is timing important? Because the way the lighthouse works is these spinning, these rota rotating devices down here are actually sweeping a plane of laser light through the, sweep, through the scene in two directions. They're sitting here sweeping this light through the scene. The way this functions is they watch when that light plane hits detectors on these devices or on the head mounted display. And it's the timing of when it hits that tells them where that is. They calculate where it is. So it's a very tricky mechanism for finding, but, uh, and they also have inertial sensors inside. So actually the lighthouse is a hybrid. It has inertial sensors inside and they're using this optical. And I, my understanding is it primarily relies on the inertial sensing and the optical uh, lighthouse optical part is really controlling drift. But as if you've used it, I mean, I would say it's amazing. It's beautiful, it works wonderfully. Um, what's interesting is a lot of people think it's a new idea, but it's not, um, at least not in my mind, it's not. But there's a system called the Minnesota Scanner from long ago, which I don't remember who told me about this, maybe Gary Bishop, uh, which was basically the same idea. This is 1989, it's not that long ago, but 1989 here, that has uh, laser planes sweeping through a scene, and you've got uh, photoelectric modules that detect those light pulses. And there's a company called um, ArcSecond that actually was bought, I think not by Talos, but Nikon, maybe eventually, that used to make, um, and I don't know if they still, if Nikon still sells them. Uh, they're really interesting for outdoor like AR, you could have used it for outdoor AR. They're meant for as-built modeling of construction sites. So it's a long pole, like a golf club pole with a sharp tip. And at the other end is what looks like a cordless drill with a little display on it. The long pole has photo sensors on it. And you go to the construction site and you set up these tripods. They're like industrial grade. They look like theodolites or like a, um, a surveying equipment. Three legs, beautiful tripod, put it in. It's got this thing sits up here and it's a spinning laser. It, you can see it spinning. It's like, it's amazing. Don't touch it. It'll cut your finger. Uh, no, it's in glass, but it'll spin around. You set one up over here, set one up over there. It's now flooding the scene with these uh, crossing light planes. Now you take your probe and you go out and you click, click, click all these places in the environment. It gives you back 3D coordinates. And it can do it outdoors because it's using these really bright laser, relatively concentrated laser light. Um, probably not compete with direct sun in some places, but a really cool idea. Turned into a product, Arc Second, bought by Nikon. Uh, and now that same idea is being used in the Vive, which is really. Um, it's really, I love it because I think it's a very um, odd, um, not, a, not an approach I would have thought of initially. It seems like not a straightforward way of doing things, but works really well. It's cool. So the last part of my talk, just got a couple of slides here, and then I thought we would maybe have some discussion, maybe about some of this, um, is about personalization because that was the last thing on the slide from, the, from our workshop that uh, Stephen organized back in July of 2017. So these were the questions that were on the slide. It was something like this. How do we personalize the individual visual system? Um, pupillary distance, visual acuity, eye tracking, 
this is Greg saying I try to offer some hope. The words motion sensitivity and uh, were on the on the on the came out of the workshop also. So I wanted to share just a couple of things. So we were talking a moment ago about Garrett Bruder. Here's some work with uh, one of my students, one of our students, Nahal Naruzi, um, and uh, Garrett and, and myself and a visiting researcher. So what Nahal was working on here is uh, she was working on methods for giving motion to people who had motion limitations. So it could be people who are paralyzed and unable to move their head or have very limited motion of their head. So how can we create uh, an experience with a virtual world you can navigate without having a lot of motion in your head? And so one of the ways was there's a complex set of uh, mechanisms for amplifying or allowing, kind of like you were saying earlier in the cave, Stephen, the joystick mode where if I step forward, um, it's not proportional mode, what's it called in HCI? It's the, um, there's a name for it. Um, but at any rate, rotate your head a certain amount and the scene will continue to rotate until you rotate your head back again. Those sorts of things. So different techniques for rotating roll. We weren't doing translation, just rotation. And then we can apply the same techniques using eye tracking. So if you had no mobility of your head, if you were completely paralyzed, you could still navigate, at least rotationally, a virtual world um, using your eyes and the techniques that we had in that paper. And we also did some work, again, Nahal, she was doing some work later that was looking at uh, what might be an effect of the first thing, which is motion sickness, which of course some people are more or less sensitive to, and uh, if your visual field is changing and your body is not changing in a corresponding way, if there's a visual vestibular conflict, people can get sick. So Steve Feiner, a lot of other people, Mark Bolas, other over the years have looked at different ways to try and uh, reduce the effect and mitigate the, the issue of sickness by basically reducing the optical flow. So what Nahal and Garrett and I worked on was, uh, was really primarily uh, Nahal and Garrett, worked on um, vignetting or basically shrinking the field of view while you're moving and then expanding it back out again when you stop moving. So you're basically eliminating a lot of the optical flow that would be triggering your, vestibular, your visual system to be confused. Um, so there's, and there are other methods for doing that, but there's one example. Um, now, adaptable HMDs, so how do we personalize to individuals? I wear glasses, I'm relatively nearsighted, lots of people do, but it's not just I wear glasses. I, even in my, uh, even though I'm at the point in my life where my eyes don't focus as well as I wish they did in the past, uh, I can still focus on near and far things. HMDs can't, of course, we all know that. HMDs have this issue of, uh, typical HMDs have this issue of the, uh, um, the uh, uh, convergence, um, conflict between virgins and fo focus distance. And so what Henry Fuchs and colleagues, his students, some others are working on, I think some of this work is with Stanford professor too, although I don't see his name here, but at any rate, um, I think Gordon is working on this with Henry and others. But at any rate, the idea here is, and it looks pretty cumbersome here because this is a research prototype, but you can see some of the results here. What they can do is using pneumatically, they have a lens that is deformable in the HMD, and if they can track your eye using eye tracking, they know where you're looking in the scene, they can deform, dynamically deform the lens in order to bring things at that XY, at that location, into it or out of focus. So if you rotate your eye to be looking at this cop, it would adjust the lens so that things are in focus here. So it's, it's pretty ambitious and um, seems complicated, but so do a lot of things before they become, you know, miniaturized and turnkey systems. So this is some, I think, really interesting work in that area. Um, last two things I wanted to point out were two sort of forward-looking tracking or capture ideas. Forward in that they're not done anywhere except in labs now at this point, and I'm interested in them. One is, again, Henry Fuchs and Jan Michael Fromm, a bunch of uh, colleagues. Um, Andre Statte and others and students working together at UNC Chapel Hill. I think these are all UNC Chapel Hill folks. On um, So this should be maybe of interest, I don't know, Stephen, to you in terms of RPE and telecollaboration. And actually these ideas were ideas that we, Henry and I and others, talked about in the context of the RPE program that you know, we thought uh, basically went away. But at any rate, the idea is if I'm going to be walking around and I want to appear next to Stephen Gilbert, here at Iowa, but I'm back in Orlando, and I want you to be able to turn and see an avatar of me, and I want to be able to move my hands and gesture the way I do, and turn my head, and he should see all of that. 
how do you capture that in my body? Do I have to go in a motion capture suit somewhere? And, you know, that would be really awful because then I couldn't walk with Steven. But no, I can actually wear a system like this. This is the idea that's monitoring through multiple cameras everything around me, the ground, my limbs, my hands, my, uh, and my face, even my facial expressions, capturing that and uh, animating an avatar from that information. So that's pretty awesome work. Um, last thing I wanted to share with you is, uh, which has two parts, is something I started working on years ago and have resurrected uh, and I'm still kind of excited about. And this is something I call cooperative motion capture. So remember, I gave you all the ways of slicing things. Remember I said the mediums that were um, light, sound, inertia, uh, mechanical, magnetic, RF. So there are certain ones of those involve a transmitter and receiver. Sound, there's speakers make sound, microphones pick up sound. Light, uh, LEDs and things produce light, photosensors receive light. So for those sorts of, uh, um, uh, magnetic is the same. You have something that initiates magnetic field and something that senses. So you can have transceivers. So here we did an example that was acoustic, which has a microphone and a speaker on it and some electronics, and it's going into a computer here. The idea here is when you wear a normal mocap suit, you said earlier uh, occlusion was one of the main problems. Okay, that's exactly right. So why should it be that when a group of us get together and we're trying to do motion capture, things start to fall apart because the cameras can't see all of us, especially if we're doing something like surgery, like three of us doing surgery close to each other, walking cameras. The idea here is that the markers, instead of being these passive retroreflectors, would be transceivers that talk not only to each other on my body, but on your body and the other people near me. So as we get closer to each other, my transceivers are talking to your transceivers, they're talking to your knee, to your foot, they're all talking to each other, trying to together reconcile the kinematic relationships between our bodies. So as you get closer to each other, it should in theory actually get better. The, its ability to estimate your relative posture to each other should actually get better as opposed to getting worse. So that's the idea here. And the last thing I wanted to mention, which I think is an awesome, which to me, I just say awesome. It's something I'm thinking a lot about and, I, and I'm kind of um, fascinated by because I think it's a hard problem, is uh, what I'll call, uh, I kind of roughly call it measurement selection. But in a lot of, so any system you see probably going forward in the future is unlikely to have a single modality. It's likely to be a purely, op, unlikely to be a purely optical, unlikely to be purely inertial, unlikely to be purely anything. It's gonna be a combination of different things. In cases where you have things that can transmit and be heard by multiple other receivers or receivers that can hear multiple transmitters, you need to decide who's gonna, who's gonna speak at that moment. It's like in a group discussion, only one person can talk at a time, otherwise it's chaos. So we can choose, so Grace, you can talk and the rest of us can listen, and then you can stop and then Steve can talk and the rest of us can listen, and so we can go through this space. But what's interesting here, so we've got, I've got down here depicted First two things, space, this is like a room divided into three regions. So you can, let's just pick one of the regions, so let's say A, you can have RF, two different frequencies of sound, uh, three different wavelengths of visible light, infrared. All of these transmissions can be going on in this space simultaneously and theoretically not interfering with each other. So you can have all sorts of the same multi-wave, I'll call it both physical waves and uh, radio and uh, electromagnetic waves in each of those spaces, A, B, and C, and because they're spatially partitioned, they shouldn't interfere with each other, if you can, if you can spatially partition things like that. So then, what I'm really interested in, though, is in cases where you can't. And so now, let's say you want to use sound, and I'll just pick a frequency two here. And on my body, I might have four different transceivers. Each transceiver is a transmitter and a receiver. One of them is going to transmit, the other three are going to listen. So the question is, and that I find fun to think about, is which one should transmit at that moment? And which three should listen, or four should listen, or however many? There's, you can't do it at the same time, so you have to make a decision. Who's going to speak at that moment? And why would you, you know, why would you care? You know, is it number four is going to transmit, and the other one's going to receive, or oops, I got a type of it's going to receive. And the way you can, one way of thinking about it is, every time I transmit light, sound, magnetic field, a receive, and receivers receive, I get to reduce the uncertainty in where that thing is, where that transceiver is. So what you can do is do computation that helps you decide which of the transmissions could I do that would best benefit me in terms of reducing uncertainty in all, in all of the things I'm trying to track. So that's how you can make, that's one way to make a choice about which thing 
And so I just I find that to be a, a really fun. I've done some work in that area with students in the past. I still think it's fun to think about. And so I love thinking about the notion that you have this space in which we're functioning and it's being blanketed all the time by you know, different wavelengths of light, different mechanical wave sound, um, and maybe RF, and everybody's having to cooperate and we're choosing the RF and the sound and the uh, light at that moment in order to gather the information we need the most. Like if we're most uncertain about where my right elbow is, we might choose signals and sources and, and uh, combinations of things to best reduce the uncertainty of where my elbow is. We can sit here all the time trying to adapt the system while I'm doing whatever it is I'm doing uh, to try and estimate the body posture and the body state. So again, these are a couple of sort of forward-looking things. Um, oh, sorry, one last slide. I, I've been working with some people on a, a workshop that I ran after your workshop, Stephen, on augmented reality, a visioning workshop, just on augmented reality, some other sort of thing with 30 or so people. And one of the things we, we were trying to think about were we have here concerns and opportunities related to ubiquitous AR. So many people think that at some point we're all going to have AR something. Like we're going to be wearing, you won't look like a HoloLens, maybe you will look like my glasses, but I'll be walking around and I'm going to see things. In order for that to function, we think, probably, in order for it to track where I am, they're going to have to be sensors on my head mounted display, my glasses that are sensing the environment. So some of the concerns is, uh, first of all, there's huge amounts of data about me, right? So do you want my insurance company to know that I have a tremor or something like that, and then maybe they'll drop me if they can somehow get access to my movement data, for example. The other thing is that there are others around me. So if my if I'm wearing a hollow, think about it that way right now, and I'm walking next to you guys, Stephen and Grace, in theory, you are you are now being captured by my HoloLens. So your privacy in some sense has been violated by my HoloLens. You had nothing to do with it. And you didn't even know it probably, because I was just walking by you. You had no idea that you were being so there's some issues to deal with there. But of course, the positive things, opportunities, eye tracking, there are all sorts of, you know, if you can do really do good eye tracking, you might be able to detect problems with people's eyes. You might be able to uh, um, maybe even do some therapy. There's, uh, there was a VR paper, I don't know if you guys saw it, uh, about, about exactly this, Amblo amblyopia, lazy eye, and therapy treating it using eye tracking. And, uh, and I think it was a lot. It was really interesting. So all sorts of things you can help me with. Neurological motor issues. I was told by a physician once that um, I, I think she said dementia. I need to look this up. So uh, big caveat here that um, it's not, not Parkinson's, but dementia, I think, or some variation of it can be detected almost 10 years in advance by watching your body movement. There's something in your body movement that is a precursor, an indicator that you're going to have this problem 10 years in advance. And you know you might say, well, I don't want to know about it because I'm going to do it. But there is something you can do about it. So you can do things that will reduce the effects of that later in the future. So good, so bad and good things, concerns, opportunities. Uh, I just wanted to pop up a couple of other. This is the end, but a couple of other references. So many references on tracking surveys. How do you do things? This is a fun article I wrote with Eric Foxman, who is the founder of Intersense, which is you know those trackers are now bought by um, Talos Company. And if you haven't seen it, Stephen Laval's book. Uh, uh, you should go look this up, the virtual reality book. It's 14 chapters, amazing work, and you can download it for free right now. It's going to be published uh, eventually by Cambridge University Press, but you can download the whole thing now, PDF, all the chapters, and he has a whole chapter dedicated to tracking. It's a really thorough um, job, so he, he's a hero in my mind, and that's a huge undertaking to have written that, that whole book. And at that, I'll shut up. And uh, love to discuss anything further with any questions, or we can just finish up. That's great. So we started a little late, so we can maybe run five more minutes or something like that. Um, you know, questions. If you're online, go ahead and type your question in the box. We'll get it out here. Got a question? Great. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you. I really enjoyed this. Uh, I'm a psychologist, and I use virtual reality, but I honestly don't know that much about. Um, the details of how everything works, as long as it works, I'm okay with it, but it's just fun to learn about what's actually happening in a lot of cases. Um, uh, I was particularly interested when you started talking about optical flow, uh -huh. um, and that's one of the things I'm really interested in is self-motion, how we know where we are, how we know where we're going. Um, and I was curious what you think about um, you know, the idea of, so limiting optic flow, I assume, is a, I mean, you mentioned is a way to reduce 
sickness uh, is so that people don't get sick as they're translating through the environment or rotating. Um, you know, other ways to do it are to just eliminate it altogether and teleport somewhere. And, um, do you think limiting optic flow is uh, better than just teleporting? I, it's, either way, there's a sort of unnatural element to it. Um, uh, does one have, you know, is it is it an issue of preference or are there real factors involved? Um, so I, I I don't have um, somebody probably does. I don't have any studies, um, so I won't, I won't say it's so much preference. I, I would bet, and I don't do work in this area like you and maybe Karen Berger and Betty Moeller and other people who do a lot of work in this area. But um, my guess is that I don't know, I would say that I think the vignetting or pro approaches that are not teleporting are useful in circumstances where it's kind of like we were talking at lunch about um, if I use Apple Maps or Google Maps to navigate a lot of times now, I'll get somewhere, but I won't know how I got there. I don't really have any idea how I got there. So teleporting, in a way, you could say robs you, or you can phrase it any way you want. You can characterize it any way you want. But when I leave one place and instantly appear in another place, I, I haven't had the experience of seeing the transition, so I don't know if I'm now 10 million miles away or 10,000 light years away or if I'm right next door. I don't have any idea where I am. I'm over, over to the right, I'm over to the left, I may not know. But if, if I see the temporal transition of features around me as I go there, I might have a better sense of how I got there, where I came from, how involved it was, things like that. So there might be circumstances where that's useful for people to know that. I won't say important or necessary, but maybe it's useful that they maintain that sense of the relative, the differential change from here to there, um, as opposed to just teleporting. I'll say a very, very one of my best friends in the world, Mark Binet, um, at, uh, at, uh, used to be at Disney Imagineering, but now at Disney Studios. When he was doing his PhD work, he and I, actually he and I both worked at NASA at Jet Propulsion Laboratory together. He went to UNC before me, I went there after him. But one of the things he was working on at UNC was he brought a bunch of planetary data from JPL, and he was trying to do a virtual planetary touring thing. And he discovered very quickly, and as we talked about before, the difficulty in navigation because the distances are so huge to go from planet to planet, but when you're on the planet, the scale of things you want to be much smaller. You want a sense of what's on the surface of the planet and where the craters are and things around you. But now I need to go, you know, from Saturn to Jupiter or something like that. It's a huge jump. And how do you do that without, and you want people because the goal, part of the goal of this is to learn about the solar system, learn where things are relative to each other. So if you just do a hyper jump from here to there, you don't really get a sense of where those two planets are relative to each other. So he really struggled with it. I don't remember what he did in the end. I think it was something that, um, uh, adaptive in that you would start off with seeing some flow at a certain scale and a certain direction would give you an indication of speed and direction you were going. And then, of course, somewhere in the middle would be so compressed it would be essentially like a hyper, hyper jump or something. And then it would transition gracefully back out of that. So both in the departure of the first planet and the arrival of the other planet, you had some of that flow and some of that sense of the direction I was coming from and the rate at which I was arriving and things like that. But in between, you short-circuited this long uh, journey from planet to planet. So, so yeah. That's interesting. I, and not only are you, I mean, that's even more difficult in the sense that you're dealing with 3D space uh, as opposed to most navigation where you're dealing with these two dimensions. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was a good question. Yeah, so question. On the multiple tracking systems and you're looking at the uncertainty model. So we did some of this earlier with a sort of a mixed reality environment, and we would have like an optical tracking system and then uh, a couple different ones, and we would end up using sort of a voting method. And um, it was a little bit more like we're going to model the types of error that the systems tend to have, and then in certain circumstances, you get to vote for this one, others you get to vote for this one. Mm -hmm. Is that complementary or more of a different? Uh, so you took the final measurements from, say, three different commercial systems and just weighted them? Uh, so it was more like it was... And a, what's the voting? If we let one win, it was like an all or nothing sort of deal. So ah. we'd have like two or three systems tracking a given point in space or a given object. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then depending on the error profiles that we sort of accumulated from those, we'd say, oh, yeah, when, it, when you're underneath the table, you need to let this one win. I mean, uh, no, it makes perfect sense to me. There, I mean, in terms of if you if you had information about the scene when you're doing that measurement selection, it's and it's commonly done. I think.
system, or at least systems I'm aware of, you would make a decision, like in the case of the highball, we would choose which LED to light, or you would choose which camera to look at, because you knew where you thought you were, and you had a model for the world, and you knew this one's going to be under the table, and you knew this one's okay. So if you know in advance, you can probably make your choices a priori, and then you wouldn't have to do that. If you don't know in advance, or maybe because you just want a sort of universal generic approach, you could do something like you're saying, that kind of makes sense. Even the same system, like 20 Vicon cameras or natural one cam optic track cameras or whatever, each one has a different perspective. Each one's sensitive to error or to is accurate more or less in a different dimension in the three-dimensional space. So one, you know, looking at you, I can very accurately measure sort of left and right in my camera reference, but distance I can't measure. But another camera over here might have a very accurate measure of that distance from me to you. So that one should win when it's looking at that side, trying to estimate your distance from me. This one should win when I'm trying to estimate your position relative to me in the world. So I, there are, I'm sure, an infinite number of ways you could combine and do these things. So that, that makes some sense to me. I like that because it recognizes that you know, some, for various reasons, some are better or worse, and you don't know why. It could be that one of them's blocked. And you know, that's not something you can know the truth about, except that just suddenly you don't get a measurement here. And the system doesn't know why. One, I'll send you a dissertation about that system. Cool, all right. I had a uh, PhD student, uh, Danette Allen, the one who uh, we did the SIGGRAPH here, and Danette and I did, and her PhD work was, which I still love today, she's a scientist at the Leeds Large Group at NASA in Langley in Hampton, Virginia, but the, I still love the work, it was about, um, make it sound like I don't love all my and particularly fascinated by that. What we did was basically a framework to try and assess the expected performance of a tracking system based on like what the different components were, the temporal aspects, like the sampling rates, the spatial resolution accuracy, expected uncertainty in the measurements, and all these things. And the idea was to give you like, uh, if you had a microphone here, and a microphone there, and a microphone there, and I wore a speaker on my head, you, what we want to produce is a visualization tool that shows me sort of like a heat map or something of this volume that says, I'm gonna do better when I'm over in this region, I'm gonna do worse as I get over here, so where are the cold spots and hot spots, and can I adjust things to, to co better cover the place I care about. So we, we talked about reversing that. I don't remember it's in her dissertation, but you can do it for estimation, like position estimation or tracking, but you could turn this, use the same type of thing, turn around and use it for like robotics. Like how well can I position the tip of this robotic welder at this place on this metal? You can use the same math, same everything, and if your robotic arm and everything wasn't was really accurate at positioning over here, but not down here, and for this vehicle, you needed to be accurate down here, you could change some things to improve your accuracy so that you get the tip of the welder in the right place. So I, I just love that sort of thing. I mean, I, yeah, send me the dissertation. All right, we should wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.